going to go ahead and get started. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our seminar speaker today, Dr. Stephen Smith. Um, Dr. Smith earned his Bachelor's of Science from the University of London and his Master's in the Conservation of Plant Genetic Resources and PhD on the Evolution of Maize from the University of Birmingham in England. He continued research on maize evolution and genetic diversity as a postdoctoral student at North Carolina State University. His research interests include genetic diversity, germplasm access and benefit sharing, use of molecular data for variety identification, sustainable use of genetic diversity to improve agricultural productivity, pedigree analysis of crop varieties and intellectual property protection. In his role at DuPont Pioneer, Dr. Smith worked to secure DuPont Pioneer's intellectual property rights and to determine the important role of plant genetic resources in plant breeding and agriculture. While at Pioneer, Dr. Smith was awarded the Henry A. Wallace Award for Revolution in Agriculture and DuPont's highest scientific recognition, the Lavoisier Medal for Scientific Achievement. Dr. Smith has served on intellectual property committees of the American Seed Trade Association, the Biotechnology Industry Organization, and the International Seed Federation. He is a fellow of the Crop Science Society of America and received the 2005 ASTA Chairman's Distinguished Service Award for service to the seed industry in the field of intellectual property protection. And in 2017, he was made an honorary member of ASTA in recognition of his services to the association. Dr. Smith has served as a board member of Bioversity International, the National Council of Commercial Plant Breeders, and is a member of the Advisory Council of the Bioethics Program and Iowa State University. While at DuPont Pioneer, he worked to double the budget of the U.S. National Plant Germplasm System and lead a grassroots campaign that resulted in one of the first contributions by the private seed sector of one million to the Global Crop Diversity Trust. He, along with other members of the seed industry and with sterling support from ASTA staff, finally helped persuade the U.S. Senate to ratify the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. After 35 years at Pioneer, Dr. Smith has embarked on new academic endeavors as an affiliate professor and visiting scientist in the departments of agronomy and seed science at Iowa State University. He has published over 100 peer-reviewed scientific papers. He also serves on the boards of Living History Farms and the Des Moines Symphony. So please help me welcome Dr. Stephen Smith. I'm sorry for providing such a long <laughs> introduction, but thanks very much. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, David, you're not allowed to answer the next question because I know you know the answer. Does anyone know who I plagiarized in the title? Aha. Winston Churchill. And I looked at your seminar series this year and I have, uh, as you might have expected from that long introduction, the longest title. Does anyone know who's got the shortest title? Well, it's your very own Kendall Lanky, <laughs> and its title is State of Department. <laughs> so I need to learn some lessons from Kendall on how to be more concise. <clears throat> this is the outline. Uh, quickly, where does the yield come from? What about the diversity of the US corn base? What do we know? What don't we know? And then we can have a discussion on where we might be going from now. Now, this is a excerpt from a paper from um, economists at the University of Missouri. On the left, it shows the amount of time a corn hybrid is viable in the marketplace. And as time goes on, the length of time hybrids on the marketplace decreases. And they say, well, isn't that a wonderful depiction of how innovative corn breeders are? And then the table shows all the single gene GMO traits and stacks. And again, they say, well, how innovative is the US corn industry? This paper worried me a great deal. The stiff upper lip of the British wavered 
I was so emotionally upset with this. Because when you read this paper, there is nothing about germplasm or genetic gain. And um, it concerned me that they and others might honestly think that um, the collection of traits on the right are the sole and wonderful part of innovation in improving corn productivity. And we all know that's not the case. So if you look at uh, corn yields, this is the classic um, picture um, with double cross hybrids in blue. They started to go up single cross hybrids in red. They really went up and, and they are continuing. Uh, the question, of course, is, well, what's contributing to that? It's a mix of genetics and agronomy. The Union of Concerned Scientists I think it was, developed this concept of intrinsic and operational yield. Uh, they say intrinsic yield is the highest that can be achieved, obtained when crops are grown under ideal conditions. It may also be thought of as potential yield. Operational yield is obtained under field conditions, when environmental factors result in yields that are considerably less than ideal. And they seem to intimate that operational yield is second rate and they then put GMOs in that class. And if it isn't increasing potential yield, they seem to suggest it's not important. Well, so um, here's a study that we did over several years looking at the effects of um, CRY 1AB protecting corn hybrids against European corn borer. And on average across uh, eight years, uh, and there's a large standard error here because obviously if you get a lot of infestation there's a lot of protection but on average about 5% uh, was protected now that's significant I think and I don't really care whether it's potential or intrinsic or what it's, it's a significant amount of yield and the poor old European corn borer is probably now an endangered species and it's interesting that uh, Non-GMO and organic farmers are very benef are great beneficiaries of this um, trend. On average, um, GMO, and I don't like using GMO, our single genes are contributing a mean of 5%, according to these data, of uh, protecting the yield that's there from the 35,000 other corn genes. Now, when you go and look at Don Duvick's studies, where he grew hybrids from different decades under the same conditions at different planting densities, you find that hybrids grown at a low planting density, the black circles, 10,000 plants per hectare, there's not a whole load of genetic gain. But when you increase the planting densities, we'll look at the reverse triangles, then the newer hybrids really go better. So what Don found was that most of the genetic contributions to yield gain in US maize have come from increased stress resistance. That is not increasing potential yield, that is the operational yield. But that's, so that, that's what corn breeders have been doing. Corn breeders have increased operational yield. Now, and, and this shows uh, era hybrids uh, uh, in the, the pioneer plots in blue and what US Iowa corn yields have been doing under changing agronomics in red. And if you look at single cross hybrids, um, Genetic gain is about 93 kilograms per hectare per year from, say, the 60s till now. Now, um, Ken Kassman was here just recently. So this is uh, from a paper he and Duvik wrote, and I've updated. So this is looking at corn yields in Nebraska. And what he's got here is the yields 
on farms, and then the upper yields are corn contest winning yields. And right at the top, you will see from about 1983 till 1998, something like that, that uh, contest winning yields under irrigation were flat. And you could therefore say, well, that's, that's potential yield. They, those hybrids are growing under just the perfect conditions. The, the next slope yeah. under that is contest winning yields. And it's a slope because that is um, conservation tillage. OK, so you've got a mix there of new hybrids and farmers learning how to increase yields under conservation tillage. And then the uh, two slopes at the bottom are um, on, uh, on average uh, in Nebraska, conservation tillage uh, and irrigated, the irrigated being the upper one. So when you look at, so he, he his yield for the top line was flat. So I looked at uh, what irrigated in Nebraska in corn contests is now, and it's about the same as it was back in uh, 1983 when he started these. So it's still flat. And what you find in the conservation tillage, they've gone up now to around 21, 22 um, tons per hectare. So that's flattened out. So again, the breeders are increasing operational yield, not potential yield. And uh, this same picture in Iowa. So here is the figure from Kassman and Dubik's paper on the left. The, um, the upper one is the contest winners, and they were still increasing. But when you look at the current data, for contest winners, 2015, 2016, um, whether it's um, conservation tillage or not conservation tillage, we're up around 20, um, 22 tons per hectare. So it's flattened out from what it had got to by 1998. So again, the breeders are increasing the cooperational yield. So. The distinction between potential yield, intrinsic yield, and operational yield, I don't think it really matters. I mean, we're, it's all about genotype by environment. And that's what's important, is improving yield in a given environment. And environments are always changing. So this concept of intrinsic and operational and potential, um, you know, when you read these papers, you need to think, uh, students need to think about that really carefully. And is someone trying to say something or are they, you know, are the, are the data really a bit questionable? Is, is are they have are they have they are they trying to make a point which really is it relevant or not? Now another way I thought about looking at breeding is, is pull or push. So pull breeding, in my way of looking at things, is you, is you select for yield or you select for drought and you let the plant figure out how to get there. And that's how plant breeders have been doing it for decades, basically. And push breeding is you decide I want to pick on this trait or this gene and try and make it, improve it to improve the whole plant. You, so pull, you let the plant figure out the genetics and the physiology, push, you hopefully know what you're talking about and you try and make things go more efficiently because you think you know something about how to get to improve drought or improve yield. So pull breeding can be made more efficient and is being made more effective with genome selection, for example, um, micro-assisted selection, and by uh, um, having training populations. That's, that's still pull breeding. The plant's sort of telling you, well, these, mark, the, the, 
So parts of the genome linked to these markers are <laughs> responding when you select the yield. So, but he's telling you, you have to figure that out. But it helps you be more effective and more efficient. That's still pull breeding. So push breeding, for example, would be back crossing. You've got a particular, which has been done for decades. You've got a particular gene. You want to put it in there. Um, or a single gene with a GMO. Or you've got this gene and you want to edit it. I think that's push breeding. So now, and CRISPR is getting all the, all the press these days. Okay? So... But we've been here before, I think. Idiotype breeding. So uh, this uh, is a section from uh, a review paper. Um, so idiotype breeding was um, brought to the fore by Donald in 68, and Rasmussen reviewed how successful or not it had been in 1987. And uh, he s said, well, the largest challenge is to decide which traits damn right. You get it wrong and you select for it, that plant will probably get you what you want, but the end result as a whole might not be what you thought it was going to be. Only one trait, according to Rasmussen in Bali, long horns, has been demonstrated to increase yield. Presumably, I, I, I have no idea how, but uh, other traits, short stature, harvest index, biomass, were hypothesized, but the results, according to his review, were inconsistent or in conflict. A breeder who desires to do idiotype breeding will need to gamble on a trait, just as a traditional breeder gambles when selecting parents for crossing. And progress in idiotype breeding in the future may be proportional to the amount of information that is available about how yield is achieved, improved phenotyping, is especially important. Well, it's, people talk all about phenotyping these days. It's very important. And by golly, how much information do we have about how yield is achieved? That's a good question. Now, there's been a lot of work using molecular markers to look for associations of chromosome regions with traits. So, for example, now, here uh, is a whole set of QTLs, quantitative trait loci, associated with nitrogen use efficiency. In maize, uh, under high nitrogen on the left of the chromosomes and uh, on low nitrogen on the right. Uh, okay, there's quite a few there. Which ones are you going to work with? Good question. How much do you know to pick the right one? Not much. Uh, here's candidate genes for drought tolerance. Same problem. Uh, which are you going to go for? This is push breeding. And um, Hugh Iltis, one of the theories of the evolution of maize is the, I mean, he loved making this title up. He really did, actually. The catastrophic sexual transmutation theory. Um, now, this was all about the hormonal balance within the teosinte plant was changed and that transformed the morphology into maize. Uh, you start fiddling around with some a few genes and changing hormonal balances and for sure you don't want to go back to teosinte. So, you know, how much do we know about the physiology to be able to do push breeding the right, you know, effectively? I think that's a real good question we need to ask. <coughs> Back in 1948, Bill Brown, uh, who used at one time to be the CEO of Pioneer, uh, he was the first PhD that Raymond Baker hired, said the genes which control multiple factor differences are of far greater importance than the single genes ordinarily employed in genetic experiments. In spite of their overall importance, we know little about them. Uh, I would ask the question, how much of this statement is true today? And I would wager most of it, if not all of it. Now we'll go to some new developments. Um, drought resistance using traditional breeding. This is the um, Pioneer Aquamax. Um, that was done through uh, corn genetics with a lot of information, well, a bit more information about physiology and trialing of hybrids in different um, 
stressed, water stressed environments and uh, making the selection more effective. Uh, Syngenta have developed drought resistant hybrids um, in a similar fashion, it would appear, but a unique scientific program, process. Um, but it, it's corn germplasm. And then we have Monsanto's uh, drought guard, which is a single gene approach. And then if you pick a single gene, you can change the expression with CRISPR. And uh, under some preliminary trials, this, for example, example has shown to give some drought resistance. Now you need to ask, I don't know if you get the answers, but okay, it improved the drought resistance, but in what sort of germplasm? Germ That's a good question because um, the breeders selecting for more stress resistant corn plants, as they have been doing, includes more drought resistance as a natural cause. So, okay, you might find a gene that makes some junky germplasm more drought resistance, but um, perhaps not more drought resistance than the, than the hybrid or an inbred line of today. You better find that one out before you invest millions into working with that gene. So I think some of the lessons that people will have learned, particularly from single genes and drought, is you're going to have to really work out the economic worth of a trait and a particular gene very early in the research development pipeline and, um, and really know what effect it has in, elite, in um, parents of current hybrids and if it doesn't do the trick, get rid of it quick. You can't afford to waste your time on stuff that just isn't going to get there. And I would ask, so here's a, a, a prediction by 2030 that yield, I say yield, um, that five tons per hectare out of 20, 25% in yield would be as a result of biotechnology traits. This is not marker-assisted breeding, that's a separate item. I would ask the question, uh, and if you were directing uh, a breeding program, you would need to ask the question, is this realistic? Am I prepared to believe this? And if so, I'm going to invest. But it, I'm, I'm a bit doubtful that biotech is going to contribute 25% of yield advance by 2030. Now I'd like to go on to looking at the diversity of the US corn germplasm base. This is the picture um, in 1985. By 1985, um, this is a paper from Dara and Zuba. Um, most of the inbred lines that are being used now to make hybrids and for further breeding were proprietary. And this, this table shows, uh, it's a bit difficult to see, but at the bottom, oh, it's not too bad. Oh, no. okay, you've got A632, you've got great Iowa lines. I mean, I'm truly, truly great inbred. B1437 to 73. Then you've got other. Well, what's other? Now, this is a paper we did in 92 looking at uh, genetic diversity of US hybrids now and then doing clustering. These were widely used hybrids in 1990 I think. Difficult to see there. But what you can see when you split this out into two parts is you've got some brand name hybrids associated with each other. So for example you, on the left hand side you've got several clusters of different brand names joining together and the same just at the top of this right hand side. But you also have some brand names with, that, that appear to be more unique. Okay, So that was the picture in 1990. And then um, what was, and this is just looking again, but here we added some open pedigreed hybrids. So you can see, I'm actually going to try and use this thing now. There. That cluster there, LH74 by LH51 was included in the cluster, for example. 
B73 was at most 17. B73 LH51, yeah, these are all different brand names, but they're grouping together quite, quite a lot. LH119, LH51. <coughs> so what can you figure out from, from those data? Well, most, if not all, commercial programs, it would appear, had developed inbreds and commercial hybrids with public lines in their pedigrees. Some commercial programs had developed unique germplasm, including from early in the history of hybrid corn by sourcing open pollinated varieties. And Raymond Baker published saying that pioneers sourced and tested all the open pollinated varieties that they could find. Thirdly, some, many commercial programs were licensing public and then proprietary inbred lines from foundation seed companies. And you can see from the pedigrees, for example, uh, LH119 is, is very close to B73. So the public, if they weren't public lines, they were inbred lines that had a lot of public germplasm in them. Okay. So this um, is from Forrest Troy, which he took from a paper that Howie Smith and I wrote. And he has said, well, this is the germplasm base of of um, 35 um, pioneer inbred lines on average according to pedigree backgrounds. And so everyone sourced open pollinated varieties, so that must be the case for the whole US seed industry. Um, well, I don't think it was before 1990. But the people who knew what those other companies had in their germplasm base, they were all they've all passed away by now, so we just don't know um, what the diversity situation was pre-1990. Now we know now, and Mark Michael was here um, two or three weeks ago from his graphs, here's Steph Store and hit the great inbred line, B73, is in the middle there, and look at all these things spawning off it. Uh, A632 over on the left. Uh, here's non stiff stalk. Uh, there's a bit more pioneer stuff in there. And then you get to Iodent. And here's the mother in the middle here. This is Pioneers 207. And then when you look at the table in Mark Michael's 2011 paper, I highlighted in yellow the uh, inbreds that have a percent genetic contribution, whoops, uh, pretty high percent genetic contribution of at least six, six and a half percent upwards. And you look at their contribution within different breeding programs. And, and then you look at these inbred lines and they all trace back to public and pioneer. Now, what about access to competitor germplasm? Well, if, if, a high, if an inbred line is protected by only plant variety protection, anyone can breed from a commercial hybrid. The parental, public, the parental inbred lines are not commercialized per se. Um, there was a case uh, that established a lawsuit that established that parental inbred lines could be trade secrets. But some competitor parental lines were accessed via female cells in bags of commercial hybrid seed. So here's two patents with quotations from the pedigrees cross with a line selected from Pioneer 3394. From the cross of two inbred plants designated F133 and Pioneer 3358. So um, there were inbred lines accessed from one company to another. That's a fact. So un under utility patent, um, a commercial hybrid, F1, and often it's F2C 
are not accessible legally without a license. Parental license, parental inbred lines, um, again, you need a license to um, access them. But when the protection runs out, then all the patented inbred lines, hybrids, are in the public domain for you to do with whatever you want. Breed, sell, fill up a bean bag and sit on them, you can do what you like with them. Now, it's important to know whether seed from hybrids from one, uh, germplasm from one company and another were, were accessed via F2s or via inbreds, because if they came through the F1, then they're going to carry germplasm from both heterotic groups. So there's more germplasm coming through. If it's just inbred lines that are being accessed, then there's less germplasm coming through, and it's more immediately useful to that other breeding group. So um, going back to 1990 when we had that cluster, when many companies clearly had their own germplasm, uh, but there were also examples of brands that were different brands, but similar if not the same germplasm. Uh, now, um, when you look at Mark Michael's graph, um, sorry, table of the most widely used inbred lines, um, where Where's the germplasm of all these people? It's all gone. Okay. So, talking about genetic diversity, it's um, it's a t it's a difficult subject to understand because on the one hand, people will say, "Do," and it's true that the difference between Tiasinti and maize is just five genes. Ooh. There must be much diversity in corn then. On the other hand. But there are more differences in the genomes of two unrelated corn plants than between the genomes of a human and a chimpanzee. So um, there's a lot we don't understand about diversity. So it's one thing monitoring trends, but we really, there's a lot we still don't understand. Uh, that's very important to uh, remember, I think. And that's one thing we need to learn a lot more about. Now, here's some interesting things. Uh, instead of looking at just pedigrees, here's some real genetic data from uh, Van Heerwarden in 2012. And uh, they looked at haplotypes within heterotic groups. So you've got stiff stalk, non-stiff stalk, and iodent. And they got three different eras, uh, the 50s, the 70s, and the 90s. And um, you can... They calculated the number of haplotype differences between inbreds within each of those heterotic pools. So the rate of loss uh, in stiff sort was uh, 160 um, hapl or haplotypes or units a year. And so and you can see the other rates of loss. And so poor old Iodent, according to... Uh, According to these data, zero diversity left within iodent heterotic group by 2037. Now, there's many different ways to um, characterize diversity. So they, have a, they had another metric, um, same type of approach though. Well, according to that metric, non stiff stalk ran out in 1998. Uh, I hope it didn't. But how do you know? The basic, the important thing is we've got a lot to learn about diversity in relation to agronomic performance, but the trend is going down. So, I'm into the last lap now. I've not been waved at, this is amazing. <coughs> so I uh, asked um, about 10 corn breeders, public and private, some questions about germplasm diversity. And here's some comments we got back, and you'll see if you, what you think. So availability of a relatively limited array of diversity in well-adapted US corn germplasm could limit further progress, especially with increasing biotic and abiotic challenges. So the corn breeders in both the public and the private sectors were concerned about this. Off PVP and off patent corn inbred lines could not <coughs> provide required new diversity to the U.S. breeding base as a whole. 
they, um, by the time they come off protection, they, they, they've been out 20 years. They've got grandchildren out there already. But they may look pretty much the same as each other, by the way. Right. <coughs> May's land race accession is collected from outside the US were seen as potentially useful sources of new germplasm, with crop wild relatives Teosinti and Trypsicum being potential, but last, and I mean last, resort, sources of new specific diversity possibly informing the application of gene editing methods. So the, diverse, the diversity in gene banks is not made irrelevant by editing, it's made even more important as a tool for learning to help you do editing a little bit more um, inte intelligently, perhaps. The ability to find market rate associations facilitates access to exotic germplasm, yet this ability is dependent upon the genetic complexity of the trait and requires large investments in research. Um, it might require less than a whole load of biotech labs. That's worth thinking about where you want to put your money if you're running a company. Gene editing methods likely increase the utility, increase the utility of conserving a broad germplasm base as a source of gene trait discovery and allele inquiry. Application of gene editing, at least in maize, may be limited due to the complexity of gene networks. There is a need for a day length conversion program similar to that undertaken for sorghum. So these were the types of responses we got when we just said, Spill your guts, tell us what you think. So there is no shortage of genetic diversity in maize and teosinti. The challenge is to find useful genetic diversity. Um, and therefore, I would say maize breeding just got a bit tougher because it requires a lot more knowledge and application of research. We were sort of spoiled in the United States by having the northern flints cross with the southern dense two very distinct races in the 1850s, which had already been in the US three and a half, well, it wasn't the US, in North America. It wasn't even called North America, in this part of the continent for three and a half thousand years. And that was a very diverse base that was broadly adapted to these conditions, and we were, we were spoiled. The question is, has that resource coming to an end, or is it not? And if you think it isn't, I think, uh, you might want to take out an insurance policy and look at some how you might want to bring in some new diversity at the very least. So the Genetic Enhancement and Maze program is headquartered right here in Ames. So if you want to learn anything about planet genetic resources, <coughs> Candy here will be pleased to help you understand and show you what they're all doing. And there's been a huge rapid evolution in breeding technologies, genome-wide selection, etc. The evolutionary breeding technologies facilitates access to a broader repertoire of genetic resources because the biological challenges of working with unadapted tropical germplasm can be reduced when you can begin to find out ways of more effectively finding if certain germplasm is useful. So for example, by creating a molecular atlas to help you sort new genetic diversity. and um, in Jian Ming's well thought words, by turbocharging the approach to uh, identify useful germplasm in, uh, germ in gene banks. This is a paper uh, from 2016 uh, in involving sorghum, but showed very promising um, results in terms of getting more efficient selection. But Jian Ming makes the point in the paper, or oh, someone did. Uh, that we can still make this better. So you can all work towards that goal. Supercharging the engine. I like supercharged engines. I've got one just outside here. But when it's supercharging the engine of finding new useful genetic diversity, it's a lot more important to the world than my supercharged car. We all agree on the urgency and challenges to effectively mine the natural heritage stored in gene banks. So corn breeders are in a really good space. Okay, you may need to go out and look for some more diversity, but the poor wheat breeders, they've had to do this all the damn time. 
because the genetic base of uh, hexaploid wheat is pretty narrow. And so they're having, they, they really have to go and do this, and they are doing this, this work. So, some thoughts. The critical importance of more effective use and stewardship of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture is key. Um, a broader diversity of, of useful germplasm um, should be more accessible now as we learn more about physiology uh, and methods to improve selection of useful germplasm. There's the crucial importance of excellence in education and public research. We need to reinstill long-term thinking and funding. That's going to be probably more difficult than uh, doing the science. <coughs> what have we learned from 35 years of single gene traits, primarily GMOs? Well, corn hybrids must have excellent insect resistance and herbicide resistance um, to be marketable. The, fa the farmer will not you, you can't give away a corn hybrid to a farmer if it doesn't have those traits in it. Would you buy a car without a roof or an a electric starter? I don't think so. But single gene resistance is inevitably break down. Uh, it's crucial to learn more about the physiology and genetics of agronomically important traits. Um, we'll need to early determine which genes, which traits are worth progressing with or not. And here's a thought. Could gene editing, coupled with use of more diverse plant genetic resources, provide native gene insect resistance that does not require regulatory approval? There are chemicals in corn, Dimboa, that are highly toxic to insects. It just, breeders were never able to get those chemicals in the right place and expressing at the right time to be truly effective in the right germplasm. But that can, I think that can be done now, including with CRISPR. And pool breeding still works pretty damn well. So, so are we at the beginning of the end, the end of the beginning? I think we're somewhere in between. The future is in your hands, you young students. And this is a great picture showing that with the, the earth in your hand. I mean, it's the only earth we've got. And agriculture and plant breeding has to not only produce more food, but do it more sustainably with um, more nutrition and, and uh, better effects for the environment. Now, um, this is a picture from outer space of the Corn Belt using uh, some, David would know what this is, some type of infrared thing, but it's showing photosynthesis. Now look at the corn belt. Uh, so there's, there is an amazing photograph of all the energy that's being created by all the fields around us, which is going to end up a lot of it in, in food. It's incredible. So let's have any questions and discussion. No answers, I've just got questions by the way. <laughs> well, Dr. Michael uh, was nice enough to share his more recent data uh, on PVP certificates from 2010 to one present, and it looks even worse. Yeah. Um, namely, that on the stiff stock side, and I also have some very recent molecular data from Wisconsin, it looks like in some of the recent lines. Uh, basically, B14, B37, B73, these three specific stocks, uh, I'm going to guess for 75% of the raw material that went into most of the stiff stock lines being produced now. We can argue about numbers, but n very, very influential in terms of raw material. So my question is, um, why, why, would, why do you think those lines became so important to the raw material, and after something like uh, 60 or 70 years, nobody has managed to make uh, appreciable use of any other raw material other than those three inbred lines. 
Well, I think um, corn breeders have improved upon those, but by using, by recombining the genetics that in, that's in those, and well, I, I by adding a bit more. I totally agree with from, that. Yes, yes, that's, yes, right. that's they right. They have done a, a huge, yeah. billions so, of dollars of improvement. Yeah, yeah right. But, yeah. Well, it's because they were they worked and they were successful, so they could. There was no need to. But the base raw material was yeah. still just yeah yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. three yeah. lines. And well, and the other thing is, of course, they form part of a heterotic group because the heterotic group said he started forming in the '60s when people went for single cross hybrids, and the stiff stalks were designated as females because they had good attributes as female producers. Um, so that then defined um, the heterotic group that was called stiff stalk was really female, a bunch of females. And then non stiff stalk, of course, is, well, it, it does, it's sort of a meaningless term. It's everything else, apart from iodine, which goes either way. Um, but it's amazing. And so your question, we need the answers to questions like that. We need to learn from history to help help us understand the, where to go and how to go in the future. Yeah. <laughs> so can yeah. I comment on Toby's question? Sure. So I think it's possible that you have network level trade offs that are responsive to increasing plant density in those lines. And that's what led to them overwhelmingly. So they were they were present at the beginning, and as you select for tolerance of increased plant density, whatever allowed you to get more yield per area with less yield per plant is what is being what's being brought along. And of course, B73 is famous for its upright leaves. Mm -hmm. yeah, which that would be one part yeah, of light intersection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll ask a question related to some of the undergraduate questions Cynthia asked about the idiotype breeding. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so then, now these days, as you see the picture, uh, it feels like it's time to go back to the type breeding. Well, it sounds like it, we're back there again. Yeah. You, you know what it was called by some people? Idiot. <laughs> type of reading. Okay, so let's, just let's talk about idiot. It's <laughs> <laughs> so hard like, to cry. I'm yeah. just, yeah. And the vibes, you know, on, uh, on the highway, we don't see individual corn plant. We see a 3D uh, with time, like the 4D wild mass sort of accumulated. That's whatever was shining out. Yeah. yeah. Because that's the biomass in the North America. When it's uh, pulling the season, that's from the NASA's uh, satellite picture. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you know, platform. Uh, yeah, I, I was thinking that based on physics and physiology, it, it may it may be a time to you know go back to the idiotype breeding to see that what is the idiotype of the blocks of the three D that can generate enough harvestable biomass yeah. and then transport something into this uh, uh, this, this, this uh, coral layers and not lodge but also like attacking the different side of the ball in the box like physics right and mathematics well, what do you think about this you know because the student asked me the question about idiotyping I think Rex Pingens answered some Matt answered some I want to see how you actually if you if we open to this idiotype now what, what, what else do I want to say? Okay, I'm not sure I'm going to answer the question, but I think in the short run, the next 20, 30 years, you're going to still make progress by more densely planting. And I think like Harry Stein's doing, that seems to make a hell of a lot of sense. Now, you're going to flatten out somewhere unless you make some fundamental changes to physiology or the arrangement of the plant. So in the meanwhile, uh, it might be worth doing some computer simulations that are based on some data, real data, as to how you get maximum interception of light and change it into product, how, what a plant should look like. On the other hand, um, I think there's other things we need to look at too, and that is 
there's a huge yield gap still to be made up um, by better agronomy, not just improving the genetics. And um, the bigger picture is that you can't just have increasing populations going on forever. I mean, there's got to be, this is only part of a bigger picture. Uh, I haven't answered your question very well because it's, uh, it, that's why you have universities. Yeah. You have people to get together and have prolonged discussions and come up with some good ideas, yeah. Could you comment, do you think there's any similarity between idiotype breeding and what we're doing with process-based crop growth models? Uh, I have to admit ignorance on process-based crop models. But it sounds like it's a similar thing, doesn't it? Well, as long as I, you know, the main thing is whatever you're going to do, uh, it needs to be founded in the, in some really good basis of understanding of what you're doing. And when people started thinking they knew about what a corn or a barley clamp ought to look like, um, I think the first response was, we really didn't understand enough about physiology of how these things work and what contributes to yield because uh, if you select if you think plants with big ears are the way to go you and select the big ears you're going to get big ears but you might end up with lower yield or if you think lots of little ears might be the thing you'll get lots of little ears but that might not work either so we need to learn we need to know a lot more about you know we, we, we don't want to jump if before we can lead, before we can walk, or what's the expression to jump before you can run, or something? It's like me and my physical exercise. I mean, I'm still stiff from a 15-minute massage yesterday morning. You know, I'm not ready to yet to go out and run a marathon. <laughs> we need, there's, some, there's a lot we need. I mean, going back to that um, statement by Bill Brown about how much do we know about multigenic traits. We, we don't. I don't think we know a whole lot more than we knew 50 years ago. That's sort of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I find all this business about the overwhelming impact of pH 207 on the entire modern gene pool ridiculously confusing. I think it is misleading and misguided to think that it is the dominant thing out there. If we had markers that actually could differentiate between B73 and everything else into that, what percentage of pH 207 would actually be in all those lines? Maybe 73% of all the fish stocks had B73 in them. So what? How much of B73 and what part of it is relevant? And if you look at what Nick is saying about this ratcheting up of network performance, how come we have a stiff stock, non-stiff stock pattern that works so well in the U.S., SIMIC has an entirely different and we can't use them very well because when we combine them, those networks do not outperform. And if we could understand that, maybe we could understand how to better diversify our base. Good. <clears throat> because let's face it, the beast that we have, genetic, I mean, germplasm wise, we're not going to throw it out and start again. I mean, you're going to change some bits of it with some new diversity. So, for example, um, and the corn comp uh, and the breeders know all this because they're all using the lateral <laughs> markers. So they know if there are regions, say, on the stiff stalk side that that now in the germplasm they're working with has run out of diversity. In other words, they know if they've got one haplotype in a particular chromosome region. They know that. Um, so what one might consider doing is finding new diversity to put in that region and see what it does. I don't know if that's a worthwhile approach or not. While I'm on my soapbox, every once in a while, people would make the comment, well, we're gene editing. We don't need to keep all the diversity in the gene bank. We just need to know which diversity to keep. Yeah, that would be nice if you knew that. Good luck with that. Yeah. No, well, you see, that's why those comments from the corn breeders I thought were rather nice. 
because they were saying that you need all that diversity as a sort of encyclopedia of learning to teach you how better to use editing tools. That was, that was good to hear. But when you, when you look at how Harry Stein's doing his corn breeds and you compare it to the big corn companies, boy, it'll be interesting to see uh, in 10, 20 years' time how the results compare. More questions? Thank you.